Hello everyone and welcome to this Easter service of worship. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem to cries of Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as the palm branches waved and welcome was in the air. Do you know, I've often wondered what he thought about that, knowing as he did where this week would take him. He would have known how fickle we can be. And so he makes his entry to Jerusalem, the royal city, the temple city, the city of God. And what he finds there is a sad amalgam of formal religion and exploitative profiteering. His fury at the injustice and abuses in the temple precincts simply spill over with the contents of their overturned tables infuriating the whole disgraceful lot of them. He's betrayed for money by an old friend, denied in public by another who said he would never do such a thing. He's handed back and forth between the Jewish and Roman judiciaries who try to decide which law he's actually broken and unable to agree about that, he's condemned to death because he told the truth. Truth sometimes does that. If he doesn't die by flogging, well then the cross awaits. Palm Sunday. We get that. We understand why it's called that. But why Good Friday? What's good about it? In Danish, it's called Long Friday. And in some traditions in Germany, it's called Sorrowful Friday. Some say that Good Friday is a corruption of God's Friday, that it was God's day for grace. Well, perhaps that will do. However we describe it, he died, and then the tomb, and then everything changed. Like 
So let us pray. Lord, as we reflect on this season, it is like a journey which takes much longer than a week. We find ourselves caught in the emotion of the story, anguished at the injustice of what happened to Jesus, horrified at its brutality, and wondering really what it has to do with us. And then we recall what we already know, that this was love's purest gift, the sacrifice of the just for the unjust, the unpicking of death as our just deserts, because its force and its awfulness had been absorbed by him for us. And so to Easter Sunday morning, when the cry goes up, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. If he were not Christ, he would not have risen. If he were not Christ, he would still be in the tomb. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And now risen sets us free from the power of sin and death, that because he is Christ and we are in Christ, we too may rise. In his name, amen. Our reading today is from John 20, verses 19 to 23. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven.
it is difficult for us to place ourselves in that room. But nonetheless, I want to invite you to try. A number of the disciples were there. Uh, Judas had gone, of course. And Thomas, for some reason we don't know, wasn't there. But the others were. For three years, they had invested their lives in the belief that Jesus was the Messiah of God. They had been listening to his teaching and witnessing the miracles he had performed, and that had been enough to convince them that they were right, that he was indeed the one. But now they're hiding. They're hiding behind locked and barred doors in fear that what happened so publicly to Jesus might in fact happen to them. And as if that wasn't enough, they are processing a completely bizarre encounter with Mary Magdalene, who has told them that she has seen the Lord, that she mistook him for the gardener, but that he's alive. Now, the Apostle John, writing his gospel, doesn't tell us what they thought about this, but we can assume they find it difficult to credit. Several lifetimes, as it were, have been crammed into the previous week for each of them, and there was the moment of triumph as they arrived. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and, and they witnessed this. And then there was the moment of tension in the temple, perhaps a foretaste of some of the trouble to come. When Jesus appeared to call the religious leaders of the day a bunch of crooks and thieves. Then they celebrated the Passover festival, finishing with the Paschal meal in an upstairs room. Judas hurried out after that strange remark about betrayal which Jesus made at the table. And then they went out to the streets of the city, thronging with people in the place for the festival, all the excited chatter, and then down into the valley outside the walls of the city towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And there was more talk there of betrayal. Peter heard Jesus say that the disciples would fall away and like sheep would be scattered. And he then said with great confidence, oh, you know, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I never will. And Jesus assured him that that very night before the cock would crow, he would deny him three times, which indeed he did. Betrayal for Jesus came quickly enough with a squad of soldiers led by the traitor himself. And then there was the horror of the trial and the humiliation and death of Jesus, which would forever remain etched upon the minds of the disciples as witnesses to the events watching from a distance. And of course, iconically, is etched on the history of the world. The dream was over. And the proof was a broken and dead body lying in a tomb, matching the mood of their broken hearts and fearful spirits. It was dreadful. Psychologically, the disciples were simply crushed because they'd nothing to do. They were literally like sheep without a shepherd. And the only thing that they could think of was to gather together and hide in fear. So I have a question. What was it which transformed them from this to the world-changing phenomenon they became? A movement that would do more to shape the world and its civilizations than any other in history, indisputably so? Well, the answer is that Mary Magdalene's unlikely story about the gardener was true. Jesus came, risen bodily from death, to stand among them. And he said as he came to that locked room and stood with them, three things which they really needed to hear. And I believe he says them to us today as well. As with perhaps similar fears and some uncertainties, we stand at the threshold of new things in our nation and our world, things we'd never experienced before. The first thing he says is in verse 19 of John's gospel, that passage we read, peace be with you. Now this was of course a typical enough greeting for the times, but it has a much deeper significance here, I think. The Greek word is Irene, 
The Hebrew word is shalom, and it's a greeting which says, may you experience everything that God wants for you. That was the thrust, the essence of this greeting in a Hebrew setting. This is the the peace or the harmony which comes from being in tune with or at one with our Creator. Now, there's been a great deal of talk, and rightly so, of the cost to our mental health of the pandemic. It has introduced a kind of discord, a sort of anti-peace into the world, and has robbed us of what it means to be at ease. If a person cannot be at ease with themselves, then something is wrong. We were created to be at ease, to be at peace, to be recipients of this gift of shalom. And if we aren't, then our very humanity has been assaulted in some way. But Jesus offers to restore our humanity to us, to make us to be as we were always intended to be, which is at ease, at peace with our Father. No nervousness about it, no dis-ease, no fear, but only the deep-seated anticipation of running into his arms when, as it were, his key turns in the door and he returns. We're not living in such a moment of cultural peace. We are living in a time of cultural turmoil. The world appears to be at odds with itself. Now, perhaps it always has been. So this gift of peace which Christ offers is a precious thing, a precious gift. And indeed, it will resonate with an uneasy people in a conflicted time. The question that rises from the lips in such moments is, how can I be at peace? Well, Christ comes into the heart of that confusion and says, peace be with you. The second thing that Jesus says to these confused disciples in this moment of fear is, I am sending you. It's in verse 21. This commission to the church to go, to go out into the world, is framed in slightly different ways by Mark and Matthew. Mark puts it this way. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, recording those words of Jesus expressed at that moment. Matthew, recalling a similar moment and similar teaching, but with a different emphasis, puts it this way. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, these sayings of Jesus are amongst the closing words of wisdom that he had to give to his disciples. They, as it were, set the church up for its agenda of work. And in the privacy of this locked room, Jesus pours fresh content into this and says something more specific. He tells us not only that we are to go, but how we are to go. Verse 21 says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I'd like you to pause for a moment and consider what this might have meant to those nervous and traumatized followers of Jesus who a matter of days before have seen him tortured and executed, now standing before them was all the evidence that they needed to see what this meant. Because he showed them the fatal wounds on his hands and his side. Jesus left the splendor of heaven to enter our world. He came to us out of sheer and unadulterated and undiluted love, and we killed him. The wounds are there to see. We did that. Now, says this same Jesus, in the same way I was sent, I'm sending you. So for some of those in the room that day, these fearful folks who were wondering what the future would hold, this would mean their deaths. I have an old friend in Russia who, in the course of a three-hour drive through the night, in an old rusty van in the depths of a Siberian winter, told me what it meant for him to follow Jesus. He had been imprisoned 
during the Brezhnev years in the Gulags because he was a Christian. And he suffered terribly there for almost two decades. By rights, he really should have died, but life had too firm a grip on him. When he was released following the collapse of communism in the late 1980s, the testimony of his life spoke only of grace. I have to tell you that there was not a scintilla of bitterness in him, only the privilege of suffering for Jesus, who first suffered for him. So we need the peace of God to equip us to go the way that Jesus came. If you're not right with God to start with, you simply won't make it on such a journey. Then the third thing that Jesus said is in verse 22, again, speaking in the same way to these disciples, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I think he's really saying, if you take these words to your lips, don't think for a moment that you are going to escape the ravages of a comfortable world's rage at you for daring to speak this gospel. Don't think for a second that you will be immune to the trolls and the bullies. And do not consider it likely that you will escape the attention of those who say that the whole thing is simply a nonsense and a fraud and that talk of sin and the need for forgiveness is really the symptom of a sick mind. The testimonies of the existence of God as a supernatural being is merely indicative of your delusion. You'll get it all. You will be railed at by a world which simply will not have you and your gospel talk. Now, that being so, you have a choice. You can stay silent and hide. You can hide away in fear and of, out of concern. Or you can speak and speak out and do so in scorn of the consequence. I'm humbled to be a member of a church which believes the gospel but I know sometimes fearfully what this will mean for her. I know that she will need strength for the task which cannot come from herself. She needs the Holy Spirit and he is given to us as a gift, as if we might inhale the very breath of Jesus and carry his life within us, whether to the gulags or to the suburban life of your place and mine. But look at this astonishing thing these words of the risen Jesus produce. And with this, I'm going to close. It's in verse 23. Jesus says to them, if you forgive anyone his sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now you read a verse like that at first sight, and it might appear that Jesus was giving the disciples a kind of authority which belongs to God alone. It seems odd at first. Indeed, it's true, some branches of the Christian church have understood it this way and have taken the role of the clergy to be the dispensers of grace through the sacraments so that the sins of the people may be forgiven by this means. I think I prefer to see the role of the church not so much as the dispenser of grace as the presence of grace. We may proclaim and do so with persuasiveness and power and passion such that people are drawn to Jesus and see his death and his resurrection as the only means of hope for them. And within each of us who knows Christ personally is therefore the power to affect the eternal destiny of our neighbors and friends. Again, we have a choice. We can stay silent in fear, locked away and concerned or we can speak, we can speak grace, we can dispense it, we can demonstrate its presence. But you look at your town or your village and you say, oh, how could I possibly do that? How could any words that I say make an impact on that? I, I really don't have the faith for my town. And that may be so, but let me encourage you to look at your road or your street. Would you have faith for your road or your street? Picture it in your mind. Picture the houses that are next to you. There will be two of them, one on either side, probably. Could you have faith for them? Now think of the people who live in those houses. You already know their names. Would you have faith for a conversation with them? It doesn't have to be about Jesus, at least not at first. Just the weather will do for now. That's where it begins. 
because then you begin to pray for them. And it might seem odd at first to do it, but you'll soon get used to it. And the next time you meet and the next time you have a conversation, God will have found a way of turning the conversation around to something more than just the weather. And before you know it, you're sharing your life and your Lord with them. That's how it works. It's not complicated. Easter is a time of hopeful celebration when we remember that Christ is alive, that Christ is present with us, and that Christ is the author of all hope for this year and for the years to come. May this be so in your experience and mine in this season. Amen. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus For my life is wholly bound to His Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine Yet not I, but through Christ in me The night is dark but I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold My Shepherd will defend It has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And He was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat
shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me let us pray our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the victory that the Lord Jesus has won for us at the cross and the empty tomb. Thank you that he reigns over all and that through him we can come to you, talking to you as children to a father, praying for your world and asking that your will would be done on earth as in heaven. We pray for those who find it hard to have hope, who feel their circumstances are weighing them down. Give them grace for their situation. Turn them to Jesus, the crucified Saviour and risen Lord, and enable them to see their situation in the light of his finished work. Give them and us renewed trust in him, and through that, renewed hope in him. We give you thanks for all of the homes and units that are part of the witness of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And we pray for all home and unit managers as we have marked the first anniversary of the coronavirus outbreak. After such a testing year, May they have renewed energy as they begin to manage the transition to some level of normality over the months to come. Thank you for all of the staff, for their dedication, resourcefulness and compassion over this past year. We pray for our society as we approach the centenary of the establishment of Northern Ireland. As this point is marked, give us grace as your people, in whatever part of the island we live, to be good citizens and to pray for our leaders, in obedience to your word and as a witness that our ultimate allegiance is to you, as citizens of the kingdom of God, because of your grace to us in Christ. We pray for the country of Myanmar, for the families of those who have lost their lives and for those who have been beaten and imprisoned during this crisis, for those who have positions of influence inside and outside that country, that their actions may promote peace for help in the worsening economic situation, especially for those already badly affected by the pandemic. For the new moderator of the Presbyterian Church there, and for all other leaders in the Christian community, that they may have wisdom from you to point people to Christ, and that they may witness to you a God of righteousness, of mercy and of love. We bring all these things to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to thank very much those who've assisted with the service today, including the musicians, the technical experts who've used their gifts so effectively in these days of lockdown, and that is so right across the church. To you, I'm just amazed and stand in awe of your gifts. I also want to thank Helen Johnson and David Allen for their participation with us today. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song 
This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all and all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live Let me pray for you. With the hope of the risen Jesus within us, send us out in your name to be the bearers of good news wherever we're found. And may grace and mercy and peace from Father and Son and Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.